A famous director uh, went into the hospital after suffering a major heart attack, and a, a celebrity just tweeted him and said, I want to let you know that you're in my prayers. And a lot of people gave him negative feedback over that. And they, they say, you shouldn't uh, push your religion on anyone else and tell them that you're praying for them. And, uh, of course, this director, this famous director uh, named James Gunn, uh, he's done the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. you probably heard about those. Uh, I guarantee your kids have, and uh, they've enjoyed them. Uh, but this is what he said, and, and he really gave a, a, a positive note on prayer and talked about you know, I, I appreciate any kind of positive energy coming my way. You know, that's, that's his, you know, understanding of prayer. But he said, you know, if you're going to offer up prayers to people who are suffering, uh, you might want to also consider adding a link or a donation or calling on your representatives to take action in addition to those prayers. Prayers alone will not change the world. And again, I understand what, what, what James is saying. I understand that we do need to take action. We do need to be responsible for what is happening in this world, and we need to take part. But I, I just can't get over, and, and I've tried two Sundays now, and I haven't been able to get over it yet, the, the statement that prayer alone will not change the world. And, and this is why I've asked every Sunday night so far, does prayer make a difference? You know, is prayer really that bridge between the earthly and the celestial? Is it really that, that connection between the creation and the Creator? Or is it just therapeutic? It makes you feel better. You get all your issues out and, and you feel better about what's going on. It, is there really power in prayer? Or is prayer more like a cap gun? Do you remember cap guns? And you'd, you'd put these little rolls in, in these little plastic guns and you'd shoot off and, and make a little noise and that was it. And, and you know, I, I wonder, is that our prayer life? Uh, that, that we just think, well, I'm just going to go ahead and, and do my best here. I don't really know what it's going to accomplish. Does prayer make a difference? And so we've talked about several prayers uh, this, this month as well as in the bulletin articles. I, I, I ask that you go and, and look at those because there are a lot of prayers I haven't been able to cover and a lot of different topics under prayer. But, but you know, we began by talking about the Lord's Prayer. How do I pray effectively? Do we know how to pray effectively? Is our reaction to this world prayer? Do you respond to the tragedies as well as to the, the, the times of rejoicing? Do you respond with prayer, either depending on God and trusting in God to deliver or thanking God for what He has done in your life? You know, is that, is that a reaction? Are our prayers different in public versus private? Do we even pray in private? It's just you and God. Not even... Among your children, your spouse, just you and God, do you pray? So we, we looked at Jesus' prayer, how simple it was, how straightforward it was. We, we looked at some of the guidelines He said, as well as the fact that you have to have a forgiving heart if you expect to be forgiven by God. And then we looked at last week about a woman named Hannah, this, this broken woman who was, who was tortured um, just just. An un unbelievable rape by uh, this other woman told that she was worthless uh, because she could not have children. And we saw her go before the house of the Lord and, and we saw how she prayed and how even though she was in this difficult situation, she still acknowledged who God was. She, she gave Him praise. She gave Him glory. And then she, she asked well, with a sincere heart and promise that whatever blessings He gave, she would give back to Him. And that's, you know, we talked about when we pray when we're without, you know, do we ever promise God anything in return? Or do we really make it kind of a list of demands? Well, I want this, and I expect this, and if you don't give me this, I'm not going to believe in you anymore. Is that how we pray? No. Hannah begged. The way she described it to Eli, who thought she was drunk, and she made another good point that you can pray your heart out without ever uttering a word. He came up and he thought she was a drunk woman. He's trying to shoo her away, and she said, no, I'm pouring out my soul to God. And of course, we saw that God heard her prayer. Tonight, I want to touch on a very different topic, a, a different subject within the, the overall theme of prayer, how do I pray when I need forgiveness? You know, we're, we're so quick to, we're so quick to change the sins that we have into mistakes, you know, you know what I mean there, that we, 
when we know that we've sinned, we might call them little white lies. That's better than a, a big lie, I guess. And, you know, we, we talk about sweeping things under the rug. It's very easy for us to, to sweep things under the rug or try to say, well, you know, I did sin here, but I've done a lot of great things over here. Are we ever able to confront the struggles in our life and the times that we failed? I want to bring you to a time of Nehemiah. If you have your Bibles, Nehemiah chapter 1. The life of Nehemiah was a life without community, a life without hope. You know, we go from a broken woman to a broken nation. This is after the Assyrians and the Babylonians came and just demolished Israel and Judah, broke down the, the temple and, and just utterly destroyed the populace. They took survivors and they integrated them, they, they mixed them with the other nations, and they, they really became a people without identity. And they became people without a temple. And to us, we don't really understand what that means, you know, because we're, we're so blessed that, that we have a spiritual temple. In fact, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But this is where God dwelled. This was the center of it all. And it was gone. The presence of God was gone from among the people. I remember when Saul lost the presence of God. He was tormented. He couldn't sleep. We're dealing with a very difficult situation. It came after a time at the end of 2 Chronicles 36-23 uh, and then also the beginning of Ezra that, that the, the, the King Cyrus sent home uh, most of, or at least a, a large portion of, uh, the Jews, the, the, the people who were in captivity. And he told them, go ahead and rebuild. And so you read about this man Zerubbabel in, in Ezra, and he, he uh, rebuilt the foundation of the temple, but soon he faced opposition. And then about 60 years, several years later, a man named Ezra comes along, and he tries to lead a, a spiritual reform, but not only does he have opposition from the, the outside, but also from within. And so now we come to this man, Nehemiah. You know, this is a man who prayed. You look at the, the bookends of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1, all the way down to the end of Nehemiah, begins, ends with prayer. He's a man who prayed. There are 12 distinct prayers, uh, some say even more uh, prayers found in Nehemiah from Nehemiah, but this was a man who loved God and his countrymen. However, before he could reinvigorate his, his brothers to re rebuild the wall of Jerusalem, he had to ask for forgiveness. So let's go ahead and let's look together. Beginning at Nehemiah chapter 1, let's read the story of a man who asked for forgiveness from God. So first what we're going to notice is that Nehemiah was a man who was curious. Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, the, the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hananiah, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now let's not ignore, as we begin, Nehemiah's position. We don't really, we're not really told what his position was until the end of the chapter. He was a cupbearer of the king, but that's important for us to understand if we're going to get the context. The cupbearer was a very prominent position. It, it, we cannot ignore what he was able to do and, and the influence he had over the king because the cupbearer was the individual who protected the king. He would, he would taste and see whether or not the food and the drink had been poisoned. But it was more than that. He spent day and night with the king because he was always there to taste and to test. And so he was always around the king. And, and, and most often, depending on the king, the cupbearer became a close confidant. Now, if you look in Genesis, remember when we talked about with the life of Joseph, the baker and the cupbearer were both thrown into prison, probably because something happened with the food. And so he was trying to figure out who was at fault or whatever reason he was upset. But he lost his confidant. Nehemiah had been there. He had been there listening. He had been there helping. In fact, many times the cupbearer would often give informal advice. We know that the relationship was considerably close because it came to pass in Nehemiah chapter 2. When the king looked at Nehemiah, he saw that Nehemiah was very sad. 
And he cared enough to say, hey, Nehemiah, what's going on? Why are you so sad? And Nehemiah had to pause and think, oh, no, here it comes. And he, and he immediately offered up a prayer to God, and then he gave a response. So we know that this was a close relationship. And so he often was able to hear about these reports that many other of, of the Jews were unable to hear. So it came to pass. One day, he heard a report. Hananiah and one of his brothers came, and Nehemiah began to ask questions. He began to, to wonder what was going on. He asked some questions. I want you to know this is the type of questions in verse 2. First, he asked about the Jews who escaped. He asked about the Jews who had survived the exile. He asked about those as well as Jerusalem itself. You know, Nehemiah probably had never met these individuals. It's quite possible Nehemiah had never seen Jerusalem. He was born into captivity and he was raised to this prominent position, so he probably spent most of his time with the king. Why does Nehemiah care at all? I mean, he has a good gig. He has a good situation lined up for him. Why does he care? You know, it reminds me when we go back to uh, the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9, you know, Paul showed such a similar emotional response as Nehemiah is doing because Nehemiah is demonstrating that he has love for his people, even the people he has never personally met before. And we look at Paul in Romans 9, verses 2 and 3, talking about his Jewish brothers, his countrymen as he calls them, that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. But it is not as though the Word of God has failed. Are you hearing what Paul is saying? Paul had such compassion for his fellow countrymen, his kinsmen in the flesh, referring to his Jewish brothers who were not accepting Christ. He said, if it were possible, I would cut myself off from Christ if it meant that it would connect them to Christ. But it's not as though God's Word has failed. He's, he's trying to bring about the reality that some of his brothers in the flesh were going to be lost. Nehemiah had a connection. And we need to understand tonight that we do not have the connection only in the flesh, but we have the connection in the Spirit. Anyone who has been born of God, anyone who has experienced that conversion has been put into the body, into the family of Christ. And I don't even have to know the name of the person across the country who is a child of God for me to care for them, for me to have concern, for me to show compassion, because that is what God has shown for me. So Nehemiah asked the question, what's going on? Give me a report. Because Zerubbabel went off. And then years later, decades later, Ezra's gone off. And there hasn't been much news about Jerusalem. So, so what has happened? Here's the response. The remnant, the few who have survived, are in great trouble. They're in great shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. The gates have been destroyed. As you read throughout Nehemiah, you soon learn that the remnant were heavily in debt, even to the point where they're having to sell their children into slavery. And they still couldn't meet the debt of the demands of the injustice that was occurring there by their fellow brothers. You read about how this wall, this great barrier, this, this boundary that used to protect the greatest city on the earth, the city of God, was now rubble. And then, of course, the gates themselves were, were burned down. They were nothing but a shadow of their former glory. And not Zerubbabel, not even Ezra, had fully been able to put Jerusalem back together. This is what Nehemiah learned. So as we continue on, we learn about this man who mourned. Do you notice a common theme? Hannah, when she cried and she mourned, she prayed. Nehemiah, he mourned. We learn that he fasted. And he prayed. Our response should not only be tears, but a cry to God. So Nehemiah 
He sat down, verse 4, and he wept and mourned for days, and he continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, how great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Let's just stop right there and just think. So first, Nehemiah begins to mourn. He begins to weep. He begins to pour out his soul. And Nehemiah not only... Not only does he mourn, but he begins to fast. He begins to show his sadness and his grief by not taking in any any of the good things that he needed. And then that fasting turn to prayer. And I can't think of any better illustration of this scene with Nehemiah when I happen to turn to the Sermon on the Mount. And I read Jesus say, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This was the state of Nehemiah. He was spiritually bankrupt. And he was crying out in pain. I think about how Nehemiah began to pray. And it's, it's just amazing when I think, you know, if I were in Nehemiah's situation, and, and, and if I had found out that that God still has not blessed my people, the people of His covenant, how would I pray? How would I pray when I felt like everything was falling apart, nothing was getting better, and I knew that the God I serve could make a difference? How would I pray? Nehemiah, again, just like Hannah, begins by praising God. He said, O Lord God of heaven. That means God of all gods. You are the ruler of the entire universe. The great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. Well, hold on. How does God keep a steadfast covenant? How does God show love when we're in such a disarray? When when we are desperate? When we are in this debt? When we are in shame? When we're embarrassed and there's nothing we can do? How do you say that there's a loving God out there? How do you say that God has a steadfast covenant with me when I'm so broken? Because Nehemiah had the right perspective. The people of Israel and later Judah were not taken into captivity because God failed to keep His Word. It's because all throughout Kings and Chronicles, they decided to turn their back on God. God kept His Word, but the people failed to keep theirs. So Nehemiah begins by saying, God, You are the God of heavens. You keep Your Word and You show me Your love day by day. The God of heaven. To whom do we pray? Do we really believe that God is the ruler, the great King of all kings, even when we are in sorrow? So he continued and he said, Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you, have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. So as we continue on and we read more about Nehemiah, he begins asking for forgiveness. Why? What has Nehemiah done that was wrong? Well, first notice, he asked for the prayers and the forgiveness of the entire nation. What an example of a leader to go before God on behalf of somebody else, but even he includes himself among the rest. He says, we, even I and my Father's house, have sinned. I have to recognize, I have to understand that it's not a disconnect when I go to God and I say, well, God, be with all these sinners at Upland. Be with all these people that that make all these mistakes. God, you, you know better and I know better, but these people, they really struggle. No, Nehemiah made himself a part of the equation. He said, I'm a part of it. I have made the mistakes. God, it's not just a mistake, but I have sinned. I have transgressed Your law. I've gone beyond. I've missed the mark. I've made the failures. 
And notice how he prayed the forgiveness. First, he used the same wording that Hannah used in her prayer. Eight times in this short prayer, Nehemiah refers to himself, to Israel, to Moses as servants. He put God in the proper position and he put himself in the proper position. The second thing he did, he said, please open your ears to hear me. All he was asking from God was an audience with the King of all kings. Perhaps we maybe, maybe we make too many assumptions when we pray. Have we ever asked God to hear our prayer? God, I need you. God, I want you to hear me. And then he began by laying out the faults. He didn't just say, I, I, I stumbled a little bit or I made a mistake. He said, we acted very corruptly. That The word that corrupt means an offense. That they were this vile stench because they did not keep the rules, the statutes of the servant Moses. Now, how do you know what you're supposed to keep unless you read them and understand? There's something else I love about Nehemiah he said, remember the word that you commanded. And you read verses 8 and 9. We don't have time to, to dissect these two verses. But he's essentially quoting and summarizing Deuteronomy 30, 1 through 10. So what he's saying to God is, God, remember what you said in your word? And then he tells God exactly what God had said. How do I, how do I become better at praying? How often do you read God's Word? How often do you reflect, ponder, meditate on what God has laid out? Because the way Nehemiah prayed was he brought God's Word into his prayer life. He lived and breathed God's statutes, His commandments. And when Nehemiah made the mistake, he could tell God exactly where he made it. And now he was asking God, he said, God, remember that occasion in which you said you would forgive if we turn back to you. Well, God, I'm turning back to you. There are a lot of prayers we could have looked at about forgiveness. We could have looked at many of the different Psalms about forgiveness, but I want you to notice his heart, Nehemiah's heart. He said, first God, you are the king of all kings. God, I am but a servant. God, not only have the people sinned, but I have sinned. I have acted offensively. How? I've gone against your word. God, now I ask you to remember your grace and your mercy. How do you know that you have forgiveness from God? You read His Word and He tells you He'll forgive you. And so now Nehemiah said, God, I'm just praying that you will remember what you said. He was holding God accountable. Not saying that He was demanding, but He was reminding. We can trust God when God says something is going to happen. It will, including our own forgiveness. I think about Nehemiah's heart. I think about his prayer, you know, as he ends, they're your servants, your people, whom you've redeemed with your great power and your strong hand. He knew salvation couldn't come from him. He could build as many walls as he tried. Salvation wouldn't come from him. He had to depend solely on God. And Nehemiah, he didn't just pray once. He prayed day and night. Have you ever prayed to God the same prayer, or the same essence of the same prayer? Two, three times? Five times? We, we know that from chapter 1 to chapter 2, several months pass. So several months, Nehemiah is praying over and over the similar prayer. It wasn't vain words or vain repetitions to him, for he was mourning in his heart. And I think about his mourning, his crying. It reminds me of 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Paul wrote to those in Corinth, the side, I didn't mean, and I didn't want you necessarily to be in pain, but I knew at the writing of my letter that your godly sorrow, your godly grief would lead you to repentance, which would then lead to salvation. And so it is good for us to have this godly sorrow, meaning I am sorrow, I am facing sorrow and sadness because of what I've done against God. Because when I am truly feeling pain or remorse over my own sin, then that will lead me to repentance and that will lead to salvation. 
Here's the question of the night. When was the last time you shed a single tear over your sin? You think about this morning. Sin grieves God. Breaks His heart. As much as we can understand how God works and operates. Have I ever felt that sorrow? Our time is pretty much up. But I want to reflect on verse 11 as Nehemiah ended. Nehemiah was curious, he mourned, and then he submitted himself. He, he submitted himself to a greater power, a greater being. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, and give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now his cupbearer to the king. Now here's what's interesting. Nehemiah has a plan. How does he find the success in that plan. He prays. He calls himself a servant three times. And in one verse, he says, God, please, give me success for your glory. You know, we can tally up a good budget. We can have sign-up sheets and registration forms and all sorts of plans. But if we do not go continually before our God in devotion and dependence in prayer, we will never succeed. Whether it's an event, ministry, it's, it's our spiritual lives, our families. We learn from the book of James, we can make the plans all day long. But our lives are like a vapor, they're like a mist. So instead, we should turn to God in prayer for success. Nehemiah turned to God in prayer. What a, what a picture we could paint as a church that God is our focus. He is the center to our lives and the foundation to anything that we do. Do we pray for success? Not for our own glory, but for God's. Through his continual life of prayer, Nehemiah went before the king and he received the authority as well as the tools necessary and he built the wall despite the, the opposition in a shorter amount of time than anyone could imagine. But before Nehemiah moved to the next great project, he first had to pray for forgiveness from the past. Before we try to strive and do what is right, what is good, perhaps we need to take a moment and ask for forgiveness from what we've done. This is not a a time for me to try to guilt trip people or to make weight be there where weight isn't there. It's a time for us to reflect, to ponder, and make sure that we have the forgiveness that God desires for us to have. How's your prayer life tonight? Whether we're talking about forgiveness, we're talking about being without. Next week we're talking about when life is short. I mean, these are very serious subjects, but so is prayer. How's your prayer life? Are you, are you praying like you ought? Are you, are you responding in prayer? Do you need prayer tonight? Do you need to become a child of God to have your sins washed away? That can happen tonight. If you are a child of God and you just need the power of prayer, why would you hesitate? Why would you wait? Why would you doubt God's saving grace and His ability to help in time of need? If you need anything at all, whether it's forgiveness or help, don't hesitate. Come now while we stand and while we sing.